in response to what Eva was saying um, about the intuition that scientists sometimes have to make their discoveries. And um, Christine, you were, you were telling us something about the discovery well, of DNA. Apparently the double helix, the shape and form of a DNA structure, um, came to either Watson or Crick when they were taking LSD or on an LSD trip. Oh, I see. The but, actual spiral. The yeah, the spiral. spiral yeah, and, and but, but the spiral is as is, is is a form of of um, it's used by many many cultures, ancient uh, as as a snake form. The the, the um, of of uh, reaching a higher state, the entwined snakes are an aspect of reaching a higher state. It's in the Caduceus, yes. isn't it? Yes, oh, it's incredible. And the, 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 uh -huh. the Asclepian tradition of the healer, going right back to ancient mm -hmm. Minoan and, and Apollo and, and all that. Um, but my, my mm. point is if they didn't have the data which would back up those hydrogen bonds, uh, yes. which the woman, mm -hmm. what was her name, did, mm -hmm. experimental data, mm -hmm. then all this intuition would be just in the air, but then it fit in, it was like falling the yes. puzzle together. Yes. So they were then sure that their intuition and facts uh, are coming together. So maybe going back to the question about what would constitute proof for you as a scientist of divine intelligence would be not just intuition, mm. but, but um, you know, intuition backed by fact and evidence. I mean, in, in philosophy, we talk about what is truth and what mm. is knowledge. One of the definitions of knowledge is justified true belief. So you have a belief about something. You know, I believe that the universe has a divine intelligence. But then I have to justify it. I have to be able to demonstrate that and then prove that that's true. You know, that, and we're not yet at that stage, are we? Um, but going back to your thing about consciousness and intelligence being separate, consciousness has different qualities, doesn't it? I mean, sometimes um, you, know, you have moments of great insight and... and, and um, bliss, you know, positive states, emotions somehow impinge on consciousness. Um, intelligence, I mean, there are different types of intelligence, aren't there? Um, I'm not sure how, I think you tried to more or less say they were two totally separate things. I, th I see them as connected, mm -hmm. and you said that you could have intelligence without consciousness. I'm not absolutely sure about that myself. Mm -hmm. I think wherever you've got intelligence, there's some kind of signs of consciousness, and vice versa. I'm not quite sure why you wanted to separate them totally. Well, probably I was thinking on the robots more, the robot's mind, you know, where you, you, you define everything what they do, and they can do just that very, very um, automatically. So that is intelligence, some kind of logical uh, rules but consciousness is be aware of your own thought process. I'm not sure I would personally use the term intelligence of robots, personally. Oh, right. okay. Because then we, I mean, if we're going to talk about any, um, you know, divine intelligence, mm -hmm. you might say, well, what if God is a giant robot? You might want to say, well, God is just some super robot that created the universe and is intelligent, but is just a super one, so that's why we call it divine. I wouldn't count, I I wouldn't count that as divine intelligence. To me, it has to have consciousness and ethics, and ethics, some mm -hmm. kind of spiritual awareness. I don't know. I'd be very unhappy. If I would be unhappy. Out to be made there by would robot. be one big uh, computer somewhere there in the cosmos, yeah, like in the Matrix. Mm -hmm. Certain traditions where <clears throat> we actually exist on three planes: a physical plane, a mental plane, and a spiritual plane. Um, now, from what you all are saying to me, when you're talking about your consciousness, your sense of right or wrong. This is a spiritual operation. Right. Um, when you're talking about intelligence, you're talking about how your mind works. Yes, how your mind. So that is then more of this plane rather than of on a spiritual plane. So you're talking about, mm -hmm. if you like, two different things in different parts of our being. Right, and levels. Yeah, right. and, uh, and within us, these would connect to form the whole, but in, in and of themselves, they would be separate. Okay, that's, that's what, what you were just saying is that body, mind, and spirit are separate, by your opinion. Would they well, could we know be that we, we function, we, everybody has a physical aspect, a mental aspect, yeah, and a spiritual aspect, and that we live on these three different levels, 
all at the one time. That's what makes us as individuals what we are as individuals, if that helps. But you were just yesterday saying that when you do Tai Chi, this mm -hmm. kind of dance, mm -hmm. yeah. you you work with your body, but you also la uh, yeah. raise your your consciousness. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I feel you have been in your objective view with, with that. Uh, you were looking out and, and analyzing something. Mm -hmm. But if you if you if you try to feel on the inside, then it is clear that what Thomas said, these things are connected. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is a change of view. Yes. I mean, we are embodied spirits, embodied intelligence, embodied consciousness. One of the questions, I mean, in the Hindu tradition, they say we're all Atman, but, you know, in, in, in the body, for that experience, we are divine intelligence, but having fun here, you know, Leela. Professor Harry Friedman, who is a professor and a chemist who did a PhD with Prigogine, actually, in Belgium. He's, he's a leading scientist in Israel. Um, but for many years he's been studying the Kabbalah, which is Jewish mysticism. And I met him at a conference in Israel in April. He's a friend of a good friend of mine who's helping me work on this Golden Gate project. And Harry Friedman is, um, uh, you know, a, a great... Um, both Jewish scholar of the Torah, he's an Orthodox Jew, but he, he believes in science. And he's been on a personal quest for many years to reconcile these two. Um, and he sent us a paper and blessings from, from, from Israel. He couldn't be here personally. Um, and Martha's very kindly agreed to read this out. The paper is entitled, Be a Blessing, Kabbalah and the Abrahamic Revolution by Harry Friedman, PhD, Bar Leon University, Ramat Gan, Israel. It's divided into, as far as I can see, two sections. The first is in the kind of a nature of an introduction. So, first section is Shem, our transpersonal nature. Everyone has a name, and the numerical gematria value of the Hebrew word for name S-H-M, pronounced Shem, there are no vowels in the Hebrew alphabet, equals the numerical value of Sefer, the Hebrew word for book. So we are here to express, write, and rewrite our individual story, the evolution of our vision of the world. This story is our history, the story of our life, of our being in the world, not just as passive spectators, but as authors who interact with the world, making it our personal world. The world seen from our perspective, a creation within a creation. Shem is the central part or the heart of the Hebrew word for soul. It is our spiritual name a transpersonal name we have in common with all human beings. In order to express the most intimate part of our soul, we must get to know it, learn how to acquire it, live in harmony with it, and cultivate it as a source of our supreme virtues. Then we can get strength and inspiration from it and become a blessing for the world. The two Hebrew letters SH and M, pronounced Shin and Mem, which together form the Hebrew word Shem, represent on the one hand the transpersonal virtues of courage and justice and the feeling of fear or awe of God, which is the supreme means for overcoming all worldly fear. And on the other hand, the transpersonal virtue of loving-kindness. If we are alienated from the blessing emanating from these virtues, inherent in Shem, our innermost self, we lose the bridge over the abysmal separation between men. Then we are cut off from the world of social contacts by vices which are the exact opposites of the transpersonal virtues of courage and loving-kindness. And we live in the cursed world described by the Latin proverb, 
homo hominis lupus. Man is a wolf for his fellow man. Section two, Sefer. The description of our odyssey from the personal to the transpersonal domain. Our personal name is given to us as an imposed identity. This identity, once internalized, becomes our individual identity, emerging as a gestalt from the surrounding background and as a unique person, different from other persons. Thus, in contrast with Shem, the transpersonal name, the personal identity may create a state of opposition between the sustained state of sameness of the person and the otherness of different persons. Here, Sefer, the numerical equivalent of Shem, comes in as our personal creation. The creation of our life story as the evolution from an isolated individual involved in the Darwinian struggle of existence on his way to the transpersonal reality implied by Shem, his transpersonal name. The virtues of the awe of God and of loving kindness inherent in Shem gradually help us to overcome the passive state of feeling threatened by other persons and reach out to them. This requires a state of sufficient maturity to understand that without his sensitivity, an individual person could never know how to actively interact with other people without hurting their feelings and, via the law of action and reaction, his own feelings. This is the message of the biblical golden rule, love thy neighbor as thyself, from Leviticus 19, verse 18. Altruistic love and self-love are interactive and complementary. It is of capital importance to understand the biblical self-love as a process. The first step in this process is a purely subjective feeling of a self-centered ego. It is of capital importance to understand the biblical self-love as a process. The first step in this process is a purely subjective feeling of a self-centered, egoistic, maybe even genetic nature. This egoistic self-love has a negative impact on others and isolates the individual from social contacts and is therefore counterproductive. It may even lead from self-love to self-hate. But the next step is to transcend isolation by using the feeling of self as a bridge connecting one individual to the feelings of other individuals. Here we have the origin of true altruism. This brings us to the third and last step. The respect and love for others opens the way for the respect and love of others for us. This is self-referential self-love. No longer the direct, isolating, one-step, self-centered relation of one for one, but the indirect, connecting, two-step relation of one for all and all for one. Ah, section three, the Abrahamic revolution, be a blessing. Altruistic love is impersonated by the biblical Abraham, the incarnation of the virtue of loving kindness inherent in Shem. But Abraham did not stop there. He also mastered the awe of God. By these transpersonal virtues, Abraham transcended his human nature so that God exceptionally told him not only what to do, but also what to be. By obeying the divine order, be a blessing, Abraham used his virtues to bring blessings to a world dominated by self-centered fear and greed, a world distancing itself from even understanding the notion of blessing. Via the blessing, the transpersonal connecting bridge discussed in the preceding paragraphs is firmly established. As a result, Abraham became a most successful and prosperous personality, heralding a clear message, blessed are the bringers of blessings. The world has known many crises and revolutions since Abraham, but basically the self-centered attitude remained and the Abrahamic revolution went unnoticed. However, 
one day in a time of crisis, it may assume the role of the butterfly effect, bringing about a fundamental change from slavery to the isolating egoistic greed and fear and competing individualism in an unrestrained struggle for existence, to generosity and a healthy will to contribute to harmony by the cooperation of a variety of individuals endowed with a diversity of skills. In other words, a transformation of a world which determines reason via the categories of understanding to a world determined by the ethical requirements supplied by reason. And conclusion, what's in a name? So, what's in a name? It is a kind of mental object that, connected in synergy with an organism, leads to individuation, that is to say, to the emergence of a distinct individual and a separate person. This person learns to overcome his isolation by the virtues of courage and loving kindness inherent in his transpersonal name, Shem, and also by his sensitivity. Once he reaches the understanding that this sensitivity is a bridge connecting him empathically to the feelings of other persons. Through the antenna of this empathy, he knows exactly how to interact with his fellow man to be a bringer of blessings. Then the personal name, instead of emphasizing a state of separateness, may serve exactly the opposite purpose of creating the intimacy achieved by knowing someone by name. Mm. Thank you so much for reading that. Very interesting paper. Um, that was a very interesting paper from mm. Professor Friedman. Yeah. Um, would you like to comment since you read it? First, what do you think about it? <clears throat> um, well, something occurred to me just when I finished reading it that's gone. Ah, oh, yes. I think it's most intriguing, the, this business of names, the Sefer and the Shem, because the name that is imposed on us is somehow mysteriously appropriate to us in, in some ways, even sometimes in the fact that it's totally opposite to what we're going to become in our life. Hmm. Um, but in mystical traditions, it was very common for you to choose um, a mystical name that you would be known by. And I think this will connect up with his understanding of Sefer. Uh, and I think the gematria in a name the powers of numbers in a name um, could also be an important clue to your purpose, the purpose of your mm. existence. This is all these thoughts just came. Sure, no, Professor Friedman's an expert in all that. He's very interesting. Yeah. And it's interesting in the in the Hebrew tradition, the that Abraham starts out with a different name. Yes, he does. That's right. Comes yes, Abraham, Abraham and, and Jacob, mm -hmm. likewise, then becomes Israel. Yes. Mm -hmm. So there's a transformation yeah. goes on there. Yes, and I think that does happen to all of us. Um, and and in many, you know, we're given a name by our parents, but in a sense, we all have to go out. I, I used to love reading about the American Indian tradition when I was young, and their custom of going out, the young males and females would go out and find their name. Yes. You know, when when they when they came of age, which mm -hmm. the Jewish communities kept with the bar mitzvah and bar mitzvah. And the name in the Greek tradition is closely connected with the reason for your being here. And was that given at birth by parents? Do you know? I'm not sure. I mean, Plato I wasn't that. his real name, was it? No, that's That right. was a, a given nickname. Many of them, that was the case. Yeah. Hypatia is above discord. Hyperate. Right. That wasn't her real name. No. Yeah, I think in a Aboriginal tradition, when the woman is walking about, the first time the baby quickens, moves in the room, she marks a spot, you know, the elders tell her the aspect of the song lines, what, what that child's destiny is going to be, and also what the child's name is going to be, according really? to the right. yeah, ancestors, yeah. Because the whole geography is mapped with, yeah, with yes. psychic meaning, mm -hmm. and where the child quickens, that's, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. What I think I like about Professor Friedman's paper is it's brought to our conference the whole Semitic tradition. Yes. And, and because it's the, the Islamic New Year today, <coughs> and they also respect Abraham, 
as the exemplar of authentic Islam, meaning surrender to the divine intelligence. Um, you know, it's one, I mean, the Western mind is very strange, isn't it? We, we spent decades and centuries trying to prove, I mean, clever discussions as to whether the divine intelligence exists or not. The, the Semitic world, the Arabic world, kind of starts from a different place. It says, well, obviously it does, and, and, and so what? So what we've got to do is surrender, submit, and love it, and praise it and worship it. Muhammad's name meant praise. And the Jewish mind did the same. It's almost yeah. if you're growing into the divine intelligence as you evolve into your real name. Yes, the, that also brings up the point of Candidate Das made when he said that mm -hmm. he believes in the divine personality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that it's not just intelligence behind the universe, there's a being, there's a personality. And that's in the tradition in Western philosophy called personalism, particularly associated with Emmanuel Mounier and other Roman Catholic thinkers, that, that there's personhood at the basis of existence, just as we are not just, well, we are a bundle of atoms and chemical elements and so on, but we know we're persons. We look inside ourselves and we see I'm a person. We see each other and we see I'm a person. That's a person too. Therefore, that person has certain rights and, and demands of me certain duties, right? So we look at the entire universe and we see, well, that's pretty amazing. There must be a person behind it, something worthy of a name. But it is interesting, too, that in the, in the Parmenides, with the debate between being and non-being, mm. I think that's very intriguing because the being or the unity, the one God, yeah. Oh, there's also the other side of that is the infinite gods, which are the non-being, which is the, the the being prior to being, if you can. <laughs> Parmenides is one of my favorite yeah, That's really marvelous. <laughs> so that the human being is certainly put in its place, because sure. we are just a human being. Although we have wonderful, infinite potential to develop, hmm. there is still a limit, because the divine potential is... is infinite because sure. we have the non-being of the gods. Well, the more we know, the less we, we realize we actually know. Yeah. So, okay, thank you so much for sharing that. Very interesting. You, okay, you has got a question. <coughs> but uh, it's more too because you know Friedman, Harry, Harry sure. Friedman. How is he combining this uh, spiritual uh, knowledge which he has with his uh, science? I interviewed him, so you can watch the film of the interview, which we have on, on tape. Um, I'd say through his interior practice. He's a highly intelligent man. So he goes to his lab and does his conventional science according to the rules of, the, of science. But then he comes home and in his interior work or in the synagogue, in his prayer life, you know, as Wittgenstein said, it's all a language game. Yeah? And there are different rules depending on where you are. So the, the language game in the synagogue or in the prayer chamber is different to the language game in the lab? It does not try to explain uh, the divine by science. I think he would love to. I mean, that's the holy grail of science. Even Einstein, you know, was, was working on that. I'm sure Professor Friedman, if he were here, would say, you know, that would be the ideal goal. Um, you can see he's applying some of his studies in divine and divinity to the psychology of the individual. Mm -hmm. Um, so from that point of view, you might say that his science relates to knowing human soul abilities. So that would be one application of his knowledge. So Thomas is closer to that than Freeman, in a way, you know, because you are working on transpersonal psychology, and he's working as a chemist. So chemist and divine, at the moment, don't have a right. clear connection. Right, I see what you mean. From my memory, his doctorate, which was with Prigogine, was on the question of the organization of matter, yeah. right? So Fr Friedman's professional work as a, as a, as a chemist is, is on how matter organizes itself, and also entropy, the opposite, yeah. why matter doesn't organize itself. And, he, and he, he, in my interview, which I recorded, he has a very interesting sort of speculation that this relates to divine energies and, oh, and contra-divine energies, if you want. You know, I'll, I'll show you that interview in more it's detail. It's also said that soul has a formative principle, and so it would be the formative principle of this universal soul that would be responsible for organizing 
the physical elements mm -hmm. right. by implication. Which is kind of what Schoenberg is saying, the morphogenetic yeah. field, in mm -hmm. effect, is his name for it. Mm -hmm. In my introductory remarks, I just summarized the field I thought we need to look at. What I want to do now in this contribution is, is just share some other thoughts from my own researches. And I've been working on this field for about 30 years, um, and also meeting and talking with philosophers and scientists and theologians all over the planet, really, from all different traditions. This, as I mentioned earlier, is the periodic table of religious and philosophical traditions that I've devised as a teacher um, to show, like Mandela, in a simple diagram, the complexity of mankind's spiritual and religious and scientific studies. Okay. So that's the kind of background to what I'm going to be talking about. Um, the first remark I want to make is, and, and to some extent these are couched as questions, right? I said that part of the job of today is to formulate some questions. I'm sharing some of the questions I've formulated. Um, the first one is really, are there types of divine intelligence? Should we be talking about divine intelligences? Now, the notion of, of um, for example, emotional intelligence or spiritual intelligence or musical intelligence, um, Howard Friedman has come up in, in, in educational theory. He's a musicologist at Harvard. Getting away from this idea that intelligence can be measured simplistically on the old IQ tests. And he's come up um, with the notion of multiple intelligences. All human beings, he says, have a range of possible intelligences, verbal, musical, mathematical, social, spiritual, emotional, and so on. And that as educators, we should be sensitive that not every child has got the same range or capacity of developed intelligence. But we're all good at something. I mean, I take the view that every child is a genius at something. My job as a teacher is to find out what they're a genius at. It could be sport, physical intelligence. It could be relating feelings. It could be emotional intelligence. It could be they're a genius at mathematics, mathematical intelligence. But they have no social skills. And I'm just posing the question, if you take the multiple gods theory of, of, of the pagan primal traditions, the green ones on this box, which includes most of mankind's earliest religions, the ancient Greeks, the Celts, the Hindu, and others, even the ancient Chinese, you know, maybe there was an intuition in this pantheon idea um, that there are actually multiple types of divine intelligence. And maybe one of the problems with monotheism and the, the oversimplification of theological discourse that happened when monotheism became officialized under Constantine and the imposition of, you know, uh, sort of monotheistic theocracy, which was then later pursued under Islam, which is another kind of Byzantine monotheism, maybe it oversimplified some of the subtlety that, that, that advanced pagan thinkers had got to with the notion of multiple in divine intelligences. So I just want to say, are we talking about the wrong thing? Should we be talking about divine intelligences? And realizing that the pantheon of deities, which we get in all traditions, <coughs> is actually a way of talking about that. So that's the first thing. For example, in Hinduism, <coughs> um, you know, there is this, this, this recognition of an infinity of deities, which is the point that Martha was making at the end, each of which has a different function. So Lakshmi, Vishnu, Shiva... Brahma, etc. They all, they're like different ways of talking about the activity of the divine. Um, now, in, in the Kabbalah and in Sufism, and to some extent in, in esoteric Christianity, in the work of Dionysus the Areopagite, who talks about the divine names, what they say is, well, yes, there's one overarching deity, the ultimate reality, which takes these different qualities or forms. Um, so in Sufism, the 99 names of the Beloved, or in the Kabbalah, the Ten Sephiroth. I think that's another way of getting the pantheon in, smuggling the pantheon back in, yet calling it a monotheistic system. Um, and I think that, in effect, it amounts to the same thing, because in Hinduism, they have one overarching, ultimate Brahman, the Absolute, as Shankara pointed out, and yet... For the ordinary people, there's the pantheon, there's the deities in the temple. You know, um, I'd like to resolve that problem on this planet. I think we'd get a much more peaceful planet 
if the monotheistic traditions and the, and the polytheistic traditions could make a peace treaty and recognize philosophically they're talking about the same thing. Um, so, and I think they have a lot to learn. And, and Abraham um, and, and that whole monotheistic tradition, I think, could be relocated within the pagan milieu that it came from. And this is why here we have the pagan academic network of the Castle of the Muses. So that's, that's just a question, a comment, really, to the Paleolithic cultures. Again, had a pantheon. They often associated them with different animal intelligences. In the Druid path, we use the bear, you know, the eagle, the salmon. These have importance within the Druid tales and, and shamanic initiatory journeys that Taliesin and Merlin and so on worked with. Um, and it's the same with the plant kingdoms. The different trees for the Druids represent different energy formations, different elements of, of ecological intelligence that are plugged into a spiritual reality. So that was the job of the shaman, is to, is to sort of sort out the music of the gods, if you want. Next point I want to move on to is this debate over creationism versus evolution. Right? There's, there's a very big investment by a number of people, the Dawkins versus the theists. And this was exposed in the film Expelled, which was one of the uh, sparks behind the idea of creating the Center for the Study of Divine Intelligence. In that film, Expelled, Ben Stein, a great um, commentator, you know, discovers that a lot of scientists who are interested in bigger questions, possible questions of divine causation and so on, things like the Discovery Institute in Seattle, are actually being forced out of their academic posts because they're daring to ask questions outside the box. Well, that's, that's ridiculous. You know, science has to be based on freedom of thought, freedom of discourse. Um, wherever you're coming from. Uh, I mean, you can't have partial academic freedom. It's either complete or it doesn't exist. And I'm, I'm for the complete academic freedom. Um, but I do think the debate needs to become a bit more sophisticated. The kind of creationist... You know, God created the universe, therefore the Bible's literally true, therefore young earth creationism must be true, therefore all the fossils were planted by God to make it look like they're old, but actually they're only 4,000 BC. You know, that kind of stuff <coughs> is a bit puerile, I think, with all due respect. But so is the kind of extreme Dawkins position of all religious discourse is meaningless, and Vienna School, you know, gone mad, logical positivism, air, uh, all metaphysics is nonsense. Um, and there is only science, and there is only scientific empirical data, and all other statements are meaningless. I think that, again, is a, is a misjudgment of the function of language um, and, and what communication is about. And I think we need a more sophisticated discussion. For example, and, and that has been going on, for, for example, among theosophical circles, theosophy meaning the word divine wisdom, right, as opposed to divine intelligence, but I think it's the same kind of area. Theosophy is a term coined by an Alexandrian Neoplatonist, Demonius Saccas, uh, second century AD, who had many students, um, argues that there is a divine wisdom behind existence and that all religions point to it, and science does too. And theos the theosophical thinkers like Jakob Burma and Blavatsky and Annie Besant and Gandhi to some extent, who was a, a, a theosophist in action, um, have been have been coming from that place for a long time. So, you know, why, why aren't they contributing to these debates? Um, because it's too easy for an atheist like Dawkins to demolish the straw man of a simplistic deity and say, well, that God doesn't exist. Well, of course that God doesn't exist. But what about the God of wisdom, you know, of Henry Bergson and, and um, Plotinus <coughs> and so on, and Ibn Arabi? Maybe there are other things, like how about a continuous creation? Ibn Arabi said, the great Sufi sheikh, that God creates and destroys the world in each second of existence. Being and non-being exists on a knife edge. You know, that mercy of the divine is active and operative all the time. Um, let's, let's, let's think more about that. The Kabbalah says the same, that in the beginning, at the start of Genesis, in the beginning God creates the heavens and the earth, relates not to a previous time, but a continual present creation. That in the beginning, <coughs> Bereshith in Hebrew, is now. Right? And it's, but it's in another dimension of nowness, 
which we can access if we, if we activate our wisdom, our divine intelligence, you know, and our human intelligence can, can, can cusp at that moment of the, in the beginning. Right? I think that's what Ibn Arabi was talking about. I think, I think that's what the people that wrote Genesis were actually talking about. And they had to somehow put it into you know, Hebrew, which is a very sophisticated way of encoding complex metaphysical ideas. If, as Harry Friedman pointed out, if you study the Hebrew letters and the numbers involved and so on, it's like decoding a script. Um, so let's, let's get the debate a bit more sophisticated. Um, you know, the Dawkins and people need to go and study the Kabbalah with all due respect and, and other esoteric systems. Again, we can go back to the notion of emanation. Plotinus and these highly sophisticated Greek Neoplatonists how, how do you explain this continuous creation of the universe from the divine wisdom is through a process of energy transformations, enemy, uh, sorry, energy <coughs> emanations that, that um, people like Alice Bailey talk about as divine rays. It's the same concept. Um, and I think physicists can, can, can maybe begin to look at, at subtle energy and look at the energy behind consciousness and emanation. That leads me to my fourth point, my fourth question, really. <clears throat> what about the intelligence of the heart? We tend to think, and this is um, how, how Gardner's insight, that hitherto, Lewis Terman, the inventor of intelligence tests, thought cerebrally, you know, people are clever if they can do maths and, and work out logical puzzles. Um, what about the intelligence of the heart? What about the capacity to love, the compassion to feel empathy? What about emotional intelligence? I would argue that the divine, by definition, is not just clever, <laughs> but also compassionate. And somehow, all the sacred texts point that the divine is aware of our innermost thoughts, feelings, and needs, and intentions. Before we pray and ask, God knows. <clears throat> In all the tradition that's said. So therefore, God... Well, divine intelligence must be an intelligence of the heart as well. So, <clears throat> how, how does that work? The divine intelligence must be multidimensional, must exist on an intellectual as well as a, an emotional plane. That's what the evidence points to. When divine intelligence comes into this plane, as it did, say, with St. Columna's <coughs> life, if you study the lives of great saints, hagiography, you see it operating. Um, in the Castle of the Muses here, we look at the lives of the saints each day, given day of the year. Um, and if you look at the lives of people like Columba in his biography written by Adomnan, the great abbot of Iona, you know, this guy was doing miracles. He was clairvoyant. He was able to foretell the destiny of individual disciples and students and so on. In the lives of saints like Columba, you see the divine intelligence at work in... in on the miraculous plane, and there are many stories in the biographies of saints, uh, including figures like Muhammad and Jesus and Buddha, that seem to show how it operates. I'd also say this, this intelligence of the heart is, is what education is called moral intelligence, or ethical intelligence. What Hindus worked out as the laws of karma, uh, and, and described in their commentaries on the Vedas how this kind of metaphysical law operates in, behind the scenes in existence. You know, it's inbuilt into the fabric of the, the laws of existence. And I think it's very interesting that um, when Bacon and people were inventing the philosophy of science, they used this term, the laws of nature. Now, that, that implies a kind of link between, you know, the moral laws that govern mankind and, and the laws that govern the material world. And, and karma is the kind of working out of the moral law in, in our domain. And I think this is something to do with divine intelligence. You know, the divine acts to bring justice into the world. One of the clues in all the sacred texts, the prophetic message each generation is, is, is the rebalancing of, of, of evil and the healing of evil and the bringing back of goodness. So there's clues as to what the nature of the divine is there. But the question, the next thing I want to say about 
this, this whole question is the question of what I call ecological intelligence. Um, one of the great things of, of the natural sciences, and I'm so glad we have Eva here representing, as well as Professor Friedman, um, you know, the, the work of biologists, and I was uh, for many years um, married to a, a relative of Charles Darwin. My daughters are, are related to Darwin. I mean, Darwin passionately wanted to believe in a moral intelligence behind the universe. He was, a, he was an agnostic. He kept open the possibility there might be. He just couldn't see how it would work. You know, in the scheme of things. So his theory of natural selection, there wasn't room for a kind of overarching intelligence that organizes it. His friend Alfred Russell Wallace took a different view and believed that man's spiritual nature, which he'd witnessed in supernatural experiences through seances and the spiritualist work, um, pointed to some supernatural selection going on. That consciousness and the human soul is somehow transcendent to the natural order of things. I think that debate is still needed, and if Wallace and Darwin were in the room, I'm sure we could have a very good discussion with them. Um, Darwin, I think, lacked a certain perception. He wasn't interested in religious phenomena. He didn't study it. He didn't have the eyes for it. Wallace did, you know, and it's partly how he perceived things. But what I do think is that any theory of divine intelligence has to include the evidence of ecology, of biological evolution, of natural selection, and so on. You know, and the question is, what is the knowingness in nature itself, the knowingness within the animal kingdom, within ants and beetles and, and, and birds? There is consciousness, there's intelligence operative. And this was Popper's point in his, in his last lecture at the LSE back in the 90s. He said that, that all of nature is involved in the project of knowing. You know, an ant knows how to be an ant much better than we could ever be. I couldn't be an ant. You know, they're really clever at doing ant stuff. A bird can be a bird. It knows how to do it. You know, an eagle has incredible vision, can fly really high, can see stuff we couldn't even dream of. A fish knows how to swim, you know, and, and we couldn't do that. Everything in nature, everything in the ecological world, has the knowingness that's appropriate for its level of being. And I would take that down to the microbial level, the level of plankton, the biological level of the cell. The question is, what is the overall uh, overarching coordinating intelligence? Is there such a thing? And, and what is that? That's the kind of area we'd, we'd, we'd have to talk about divine intelligence. It's the coordinatory function. Right? Um, and in us humans, who are a microcosm, because we, we, we have all the capacity of all the other animals. We can fly, swim, you know, uh, do all the other stuff. And that's symbolized in the Celtic myth of Lu, the, the, the god who can do all the functions, right? Um, and yet we have in our central nervous system a structure more complex than, than anything else on the planet, the human brain. So maybe we're a kind of a trace to the complexity of evolution that got us to be us. And we're now able to reflect on that whole evolutionary process. And, and as Mohammed said, our function then is to praise to say, wow, this is some creation. <laughs> so, so Muhammad would say, intelligence should be accompanied by worship. When you see evidence of the divine intelligence, you should worship. Right? And, and I think that's, that's many of the spiritual teachers of mankind would say the same. OK, so let's look at some of these other intelligences. Um, I just want to mention some of them. If, if we're talking about divine intelligences, plural, rather than divine intelligence, singular. Well, one thing I want to flag up is, is musical intelligence. I personally wouldn't want to go to a heaven or meet a god who isn't really into music. <laughs> musical intelligence, I think, is, shows the beauty behind creation. When I listen to Bach or Handel, I've just been to Halle in Germany, where Handel played the organ and was inspired, eventually writing the Messiah. When I listen to music like that, Tears come in my eyes, and I know why creation exists, right? Um, so to me, the deities, you know, have musical intelligence. And that's why I love the stories about, in heaven, there are angels with harps, and, and the music of the spheres. The whole universe is singing, right? And, and in the Druid tradition, the bards, our duty is to, is to sing a little bit back to them, to say thank you for us being here. 
And so people that have that gift, the great musicians of this planet, to me they're like the gods walking among us. I only have a little bit of that gift. But, you know, I recognize in Bach or Handel or Ravi Shankar or George Harrison. You know, they're like, to me, they're walking embodiments of musical intelligence. And that's why I think the ancients rightly called music after the daughters of the gods. The muses are the kind of bestowers of music. It's one of the great blessings for mankind. And I, I'm very interested in musicology. It's the complexity of musical harmonies that, to me, are a metaphor for complex knowledge. They've now discovered in um, philosophers of education that if you have music compulsory in the education system, the kids generally are much cleverer. They're better at maths, they're better at social skills. To be able to be musical, to sing in a choir or play in an orchestra or chamber orchestra, means you learn all kinds of other skills. Timing, harmony, pitch, you know, the whole thing. So this, this to me some part of divine intelligence must be musical. And this is where the, the goddesses of knowledge come in, the muses. You know, they're singing. They're, they're, they're always shown as making music. And music is the conversation the muses have. Hence, this castle of the muses. Okay, next thing I think the gods have is, is mathematical intelligence. Now, this, this is awesome to me. The, the, <laughs> the kind of thing Hypatia could do and, and Euclid. How, I mean, I've dabbled in mathematics enough to know I've been involved with the history of mathematics for many years. I've looked at the history of Islamic mathematics, the invention of algebra. I've looked at the history of Hindu mathematics, Babylonian mathematics, Chinese, you know. It's awesome, just simply the ability to think numerically. Now, Pythagoras, when, I was, when he was asked, what, what is the real source of existence? He said it's... It's number, it's arithmi. Now, better to translation would be to say it's numbering. You know, Pythagoras didn't mean the numbers of the gods. He meant it's the faculty of ordering numbers and, and, and manipulating them that is a language for creativity itself. And in the Tetractus, the Pythagorean uh, ten equilateral triangle of, of ten points, you have a metaphor for creation from the one, the monad, comes the dyad, the two, the, the, the three, the triad, and so on. This is a metaphor for all existence. Ultimately, it's the language of love put in symbolic form. So I think mathematical intelligence, again, is something that the gods do. And it points to me to a divine harmony, an, a numbering, an ordering behind existence. And, and, but the question is, what is the Newman behind number? This is still with the philosophy of mathematics. And I think more attention, I mean, I'm, I'm always frustrated when kids come to my religious studies classes out of a maths lesson, and they're very clever, they've learned all the equations. And I ask them, well, what then is number? And they say, well, I don't know, sir. I've never thought of that. You know, well, don't your teachers actually ask you what number might be? And, you know, no, no, we just learn how to do it, sir. You know, I think there's a place for the philosophy of mathematics in our school curricula. And, and, and that's a bridge into metaphysics and, and philosophy. Okay, I want to move on and say that the other thing I want to share is, is this question of levels of intelligence. Um, you know, we talk about intelligence. It's a very complex thing, actually. The word, just to share, our friend kindly shared some of the words from Slovenian. Intelligence is a Latin word. At, in root, intellect, and it means it means the ability to connect up ideas and, and words. Intellecto is inter is between, and and the lect bit is related to the word for word, a lexicon, logos in Greek, and so on. So it's it's the ability to connect up ideas that seem different, right? Um, e. M. Forster had a great motto. He said, only connect. That was the summing up of his philosophy of life. You know? And the problem with education and society and politics is everything is disconnected. Right? People are disconnected from each other, from, from parts of themselves. Schizophrenia is when there's no more communication between different parts of yourself. Illness is when people become disconnected, literally you know, amputated. So, so 
the healing work, the intelligence, is the ability to connect everything up. Different spheres of knowledge, different spheres of being. And, you know, the Latin language is encoded with its own wisdom. If you look at etymology, you often find the roots of ideas. So, so consciousness, then, is, is the flow. As I see it, consciousness is like the energy or the electricity that flows between these different nodes of knowledge, right, at different levels, which, which then makes a wholeness of everything, which brings cosmic intelligence and ultimately divine intelligence. You know, which, and that's another word, really, for enlightenment. That's what Buddhists call enlightenment. And it's this concept of knowing everything isn't a quantitative thing. It's not that Buddha knew every bus ticket that would ever be printed in London buses, you know, 2,000 years after he was dead. <laughs> you know, he didn't have that kind of stuff in his mind, thank God. But he knew qualitatively that, yes, transport's important, there will be vehicles, probably there'll be, you know, won't need horses anymore, and, and people will be still, you know, having to pay something to get on the bus. You know, I mean, he knew qualitatively how karma operates. And so, so divine intelligence, I think, operates in the same kind of way. It's about, it's about knowing the wholeness of things. There's a problem. Isn't, isn't consciousness also relative to perception? We all perceive at the level of existence that we operate on. So a bus driver who's done it for 40 years, never really had a chance to study, you know, will have a certain kind of limited tunnel vision of reality. Um, this was the point, wasn't it, of Marx? This was why he rebelled against capitalism, because it pigeonholes people in individual little jobs and functions and denies their, what he called their species intelligence, right? Their species identity. We have the right to be Renaissance people. That's what Marx and Engels said. And I, I agree with Marxism up to that point, along with people like Zizek and, and neo-Hegelian philosophers on the planet. We have the right to that Promethean intelligence. But the way it was tried to implement under Stalin and co. through violence was, was an insult to moral intelligence. Right? So we've got to rethink that project and somehow create a social system that enables us to access our full potential, but, but voluntarily, cooperatively, and with love, rather than force and violence. So, you know, that to me is the, the work of the Buddha mind in manifestation. In, in the Christian tradition, they talk about theosis, which is how the divine and, and the individual soul come into, come into connection. Some Christ, and this has been a big debate in Christianity, is it possible for an individual human to know God? Right. And what does that mean? Well, Christ said it absolutely simply, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall know God. You know, <laughs> absolutely simple from the Master. If you purify your innermost heart, your feelings, your conscience, your mind, you will know God. How? Well, the vehicle of knowing in your deepest self then becomes pure enough to access those subtle energies. That's theosis. Gregory Palamas, the great saint, Hesychast on Mount Athos, taught a way to do it. and Initially was called a heretic, and then he was allowed to be a saint. Okay. Um, and, and I know that um, you know, the Archbishop of Canterbury is particularly interested in that orthodox mysticism, which is, which is a path that's still going. Um, another thing I'd say about divine intelligence is, is that it's by definition creative. You know, people that have good ideas, or you meet somebody, you have a great conversation at a party with somebody, and you go away feeling humming with energy. You feel creative. You want to go out and, you know, found an institute or invent a new language or write a book or something, you know. To me, the divine intelligence must be like that times a million. That divine intelligence is so amazing. It, it, it was having a conversation somewhere and created planet Earth because that conversation was so exciting. You know? um, so, so I think by definition, the divine intelligence is creative. And that's why God is always called the creator. I think it's time to unpick what that means philosophically. Not just sort of trot around singing hymns to God the Creator. We've actually got to think through what that means. In what way is the divine intelligence created? What, what are the implications? Well, it's life engendering. If, if the divine intelligence is created, that means it wants us to be here. 
you know, um, that life is good, as the Bible affirms. God creates and then says, wow, that's good. Life is tov in Hebrew. It's good. You know, it's meant to be good. So anything we're doing on this plane to further moral goodness is, is helping the creator. And that's why, you know, the saints are creative people, Mother Teresa's and co. And just the little anonymous saint that keeps the school going or keeps your family going or runs the local shop when all the other businesses have failed. You know, those people we all know in the ordinary community, they're, they're affirming the tolfness, the goodness of existence. And they're creative. Sexuality is part of that. Life loves to create. And sexuality is the affirmation of that. And so that leads to the, to the next point, which is that the divine intelligence has to be somehow incorporative of gender. Sexuality is not against the divine intelligence. And this brings back the goddess tradition and, and the repressed goddess. What happened to her? You know, the pagans had the goddess. You talked earlier about that, you know, that was your path when you connected to the divine feminine. Feminine intelligence is complementary to and different from masculine intelligence. Psychologists study this, you know, the right and the left side of the brains. The more intuitive, empathetic, um, you know, knowingness that women have. It's fascinating. Now, if God is both male and female, God is, the Hindus say, for want of a better explanation, that the gods are like divine loving couples. Shiva and Shakti. You know, they are a god and a goddess in, in, in love, deeply in love. And it's out of their love that this world comes into being. That's such a beautiful story, right? Brahma and, and Sarasvati, they love each other so much they create this universe. Sarasvati is the goddess of intelligence. She's the, 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 the educator, the one that manifests. Also the goddess of music. And likewise, Vishnu and Lakshmi. And you have the same in the, in the Greek understanding. Hera and Zeus, for all their squabbles and difficulties, you know, they, they still engender everything. So I think, I think the repression of women on the planet, the repression of the feminine intelligence, or contrary-wise, the, the enforced masculinization of, of the feminine in order to achieve power, equality with men, women often had to deny their femininity. I think that all is an aspect of this question of divine intelligence. Somehow that goddess tradition has to come back on full equality terms with, with the god tradition. And this is where the muses come in, and since they're the kind of patronesses of that, that project. The next point I want to make is that divine intelligence is obviously limited by our human capacity to take it in. And this is restricted by our limitations of language, and also by our limitations of education. Also, shortness of life, you know, I mean, I spent 35 years, 40 years studying the great philosophical teachings of the planet. I'm only scratching the surface. You know, there's too much to learn, too much to know. And, and also then poorness of memory. You forget stuff. Well, us, us humans, little short little vehicles, we have tiny little lifespans, memories fail. Um, I mean, there's a wonderful saying about Gurdjieff once. Somebody said, um, you know, who'd known Gurdjieff that he wished he'd remembered even the things Gurdjieff had forgotten, you know. Um, so, so what can we do about this? The other thing is we have a lack of attention and focus, a lack of will to master knowledge, which is something Gurdjieff always emphasized. You have to actually seriously make an effort to become enlightened. It's not just going to happen like rain falling out of the sky. So we lack enough sufficient love. We, we, a love of knowledge, you know, we, we, I mean, especially today with the internet, and, and, and it's become a culture of fast foods. You look something up on Wikipedia, you think you know it. You know, knowledge isn't that easy, it's not that cheap. People have died and sweated blood to bring us where we are. And I think if that sort of intensity of, of devotion to learning and, and the pursuit of knowledge goes from mankind, it'll be a very sad thing. We'll end up you know, a bunch of kind of uh, rather limited beings with very intelligent computers running the planet. And that's a danger. Uh, Rudolf Steiner people talked about. They called it the Aramanic principle, which is the robotization of mind, which is apparent intelligence, but actually the soul's gone.
There's also the problem people learn things for the wrong reasons. Maybe status or, or, or a fear. You can't educate people for the wrong reasons. And this leads me to my, my, my 11th point, which is about peace intelligence. Um, as opposed to what I call the militarization of knowledge. Uh, knowledge for power and status and false hierarchy is associated with what I call diabolic intelligence or false intelligence. I mean, isn't it a joke? We use the term military intelligence. Yeah. And, and these military intelligence forces around the planet have budgets of billions. Okay. Yet what are, what are they actually doing for the planet? Are they actually helping us? Are they creating anything new? I mean, occasionally you get spin-offs. You know, the internet was a product partly of intelligence use of sharing information. But what I'm saying is, take that forward into a new domain, and we would, we would then work for peace intelligence on the planet. And <clears throat> instead of learning to fight wars, we would learn to make peace. That, to me, would be actually living up to more divine intelligence. Right? Um, you know, in the CIA headquarters, there's, there's the quote from St. John on the floor. Um, the truth shall set you free in, in Washington. <coughs> you know, what I'm saying is that it's time we actually got set free and, and, and asked these profound questions. Because otherwise we end up with Auschwitz and genocide and we end up with racism and we end up with 9-11s. So I think it's a wake-up call for the planet, you know. We're either going to actually try and work out what the divine actually wants for this planet using a combination of reason and, and esotericism, or we're going to kind of surrender the planet to, to false military intelligence hierarchies. What I'm saying, in effect, is, is as philosophers, we should be talking about peace intelligence. And that leads me to my next um, question. And these are just questions I'm throwing out here, which is <coughs> difficult. If we're talking about divine intelligence, shouldn't we be talking about the, the opposite? You know, if the world was created by a divinely intelligent super being, and we're all meant to be good, and everything's supposed to be perfect, well, why is there so much suffering and evil and cruelty and violence in the world? Why was there Auschwitz? Why was there Hiroshima? Why was there 9-11? So do we end up talking about a kind of diabolic intelligence? Is there a contrary force? <clears throat> Now, according to dualistic traditions, there's a devil also in the plot of history. There's violence, there's hatred and anger. What if, what if God actually is rather stupid? God turns out to be quite jealous. You know, um, there's a war between God and the devil. You know, I mean, how, what a simple story that is. How, how stupid. Or is it just our image of God that's a bit at fault? I mean, hang on, God wanted human sacrifice? Um, you know, what, what, a, what a kind of primitive notion of God. So <coughs> maybe what we've got here is an evolution of ideas of God. If you look at the earliest times of primitive religions, most tribes, all tribes, practice human sacrifice. Eventually, Abraham, and I think Harry Friedman talked about the Abrahamic revolution. <coughs> Part of that is Abraham realized actually human sacrifice is no longer needed. So, a moral intelligence kicked in, and, and we moved to a higher moral plane, which was the prophetic inheritance. But I would, I would say the evolution of God continues, as Whitehead said. You know, we have a process theology, if you want. God is a verb, not a noun. And so God can't be limited to, to religions or to particular prophetic lineages. Um, you know, is God limited to that? No. Would God approve of things like the Twin Towers or the bombing of Dresden or the bombing of London and the Blitz? I think we need to really think this through in detail. Is there a kind of Aramanic intelligence or a Luciferic intelligence or a Satanic intelligence? You know, the devil is supposed to be very clever, right? All the myths of the Antichrist and so on. He's a very clever chap. Um, leads people astray. And I think there's a suspicion of the wrong kind of intelligence, which I think is probably quite wise. Um, so I think we need to, the work of the study of divine intelligence has to deconstruct these stories and myths. It's very interesting, actually. If you look in the Islamic tradition, the devil is called Iblis. Now, in the story of Islam and Sufism, 
Iblis was a super intelligent angel, God's second in command, who existed even before this planet, before mankind was created. And when Allah created mankind, Allah was very proud of us and said, look, I've created this wonderful thing, mankind. Isn't it wonderful? Uh, look, all you angels, look down at lovely mankind. I want you to bow down and worship my new creation. He's so sweet. Look, there's Adam and there's Eve. Aren't they beautiful? And all the angels bowed down and said, wow, God, you've made a great creation there. But Iblis, who was the cleverest of the lot, said, come on, God. You've got to be joking. Look at them. They're like little worms. They hardly can string two words together. They can't do anything right. They keep falling over. They haven't got any mor morality or intelligence. They can't make anything yet. They're bashing rocks together to make sparks. Why would I fall down and worship them? I'm a, I'm a super intelligent angel. I've been here since the beginning of dawn of the universe. And Iblis said, no, I won't bow down and worship them. <clears throat> because they're not clever enough. Now, there's two versions of what happened next. In the Orthodox Islamic tradition, Allah, God, at that point, threw Iblis out of heaven and said, well, you cheeky angel, um, you're, you're out, and threw him down into hell, right, where he's been ever since, causing trouble. The other tradition, which is uh, kept by the Yazidi tradition, which is one of the most ancient spiritual traditions of the Middle East, which is a Gnostic, pre-Islamic Middle Eastern film, says they know what actually happened, which is that God turned around, Allah turned around to Iblis and said, well, my dear Iblis, you've proved yet again that you really are the most intelligent angel because that's the right answer. Of course I don't want you to bow down and worship these little creations. Look at those other silly angels bowing down. No, of course I don't want but what I do want you to do is to help them, please. They need your education. They need your help. So, so please go among them and give them religion and teach them to read and write and send them some fire. And, you know, I'll leave you to help bring them up. So that the Yazidis say that Lucifer is not something to be afraid of. Lucifer's not actually the devil. Lucifer is God's right-hand angel who's actually been guiding and helping us all. So the Adam and Eve legend, when Lucifer gives us gives Eve the apple, he's actually giving a bit of knowledge, a tiny portion of divine intelligence, which is all we can cope with. Right? So, so now this is interesting, isn't it? Because there's a saying in Christianity that Christus verus Luciferus. Christ is the true Lucifer, the true light bringer. Right? So there's also the Greek tradition of Prometheus. Now, it's interesting we have someone from the Prometheus Trust here. In the Promethean tradition, Prometheus brings fire to mankind and knowledge and intelligence, right? And, and yet is hated by Zeus, who's the kind of heavenly despot who wants to keep all knowledge to himself, right? But Prometheus is on the side of mankind and actually helps create us. According to Greek mythology, Prometheus helps make us out of clay and therefore wants to help us by giving us fire. So, so for me, I argue, as a, as a mythographer of ancient religions, that the source of the Prometheus legend, as Robert Graves, were he here, would say, in his work on the Greek myths and Hebrew myths, goes back to the same root as the Lucifer story. These are Bronze Age cultures, pre prehistoric ancient cultures, half kind of Greek, half Hebrew, and, and you know, they knew something funny was going on <laughs> around fire and intelligence. And, and if we look back at the origin of fire on this planet, 200,000 BC probably, you can imagine our ancestors kind of beginning to think. And, and yet they were also afraid that maybe they were getting into areas of the divine that the divine didn't want them to. And yet also feeling that some aspects of the divine wanted them to. And we've had this love-hate relationship with knowledge ever since. Um, and that is what comes out in things like the Iblis story and the Lucifer story. And, and this is where the, you know, the Satanists who are in, in, you know, in, in the grid, I mean, they're one of the new religious movements, they argue that the whole Lucifer story has been misunderstood and, and that we should actually be giving thanks to this, this, this prodding of intelligence. Um, Prometheus, of course, gets punished. His liver's torn out. 
you know, he's tortured by Zeus because he has foreknowledge. Um, but it's another thing that's very interesting is that I discovered recently, I went to Athens, Prometheus actually has an affair with the goddess Athena. Now, very few people know that in mythology. In some accounts, Prometheus and Athena have a love affair. Now, Athena's always known as the virgin goddess. She doesn't have lovers. But actually, I'm revealing a great secret here at this conference. <laughs> she does. And it was Prometheus. And I find that such a lovely story. I, I discovered this around the time I went to the Acropolis in Athens. It's communing with Athena energies. And I think Athena and Prometheus are like the patron saints of this project, the center for the study of divine intelligence. And what I'm saying here is that, is that we have to have courage, as Kant said, dare to be wise, sapere aude. We have to really, really understand this diabolic God versus devil myth, because it's haunting the human imagination, and it caused the Twin Towers to come down. Bin Laden and the extreme Al-Qaeda factions who were involved in it literally kind of believed they're fighting the devil, which is the U USA. The, the USA people, the intelligence agents, the CIA people, etc., the Bush lot, thought they were fighting the devil, which is Islamic extremism. I would say, as a philosopher of peace, they're both fighting the wrong myths. What they should all have been doing is sitting down at this conference, talking about real divine intelligence and healing this ancient split, which is in the collective psyche of mankind. That's what Jung said. We have to heal this kind of concept of the devil and, and God. We have to heal that, that ancient war. To do that, we have to go back to Zoroaster, as I've emphasized to my students for many years. Look at the notions in Zoroastrianism of how Ahura Mazda and Ahriman ever fell out. Zoroastrian priests should be here at this conference, talking about their understanding. Ahura Mazda is, is divine intelligence by definition, but he has this shadow, Ahriman. Why? Where does that come from? We can talk at this point to ufologists and cosmologists who say that the planet is, is kind of under attack from different factions of aliens. Some are good, some are not. You know, that's one attempt to scientifically explain what's going on. The Zoroastrians say the struggle in heaven between Ahura Mazda and Ahriman predates this planet. It pre-exists mankind. We were created as a battleground in which to have out this final battle. The Seashant, the Messiah, will, will lead the victory of the righteous forces. What I'm saying as a transpersonal historian is we have to, we have to reclaim that Seashant energy, each one of us on this planet. Each one of us is the Seashant and needs to reawaken that energy. That's the call to divine intelligence. Interestingly, the Druids were also known as snakes. So they worked with that reconciled energy of, of the divine. Um, you know, I think this is what I call the antidote to sophiophobia. Sophiophobia is a medical term I coined, the fear of wisdom. You know, other, other psychologists have talked about this. I think we have to find an antidote to sophiophobia. And that has to be the courage to be wise, as Kant said. Okay, moving on. Multiple intelligences, then. Let's agree on that. Multiple divine intelligences. Well, we come back to the muses, bless them, because each one of them is like a deity or patron of a different area of knowledge, a different area of cognition. And that's why Plato, who was a wise chap, made them the guardians of academic knowledge. Just as in a university, you have different faculties with different kinds of knowing going on. So you go to Oxford, some people are doing musicology, some are doing geography, some are doing biology, and so on. You know, the muses are actually behind that. And, and this is a way of celebrating the multiple intelligence of the deity. Okay, and this is why, why Aristotle also then took Plato's genius and, and invented the sciences. Aristotle was so much in love with learning, he said, well, this is so extraordinary, we have to, we have to get concrete knowledge. You know, so, so both the Aristotelian and the Platonic method are needed for the center of the study of divine intelligence. And, and that's why it's been great to have a variety of people represented here. Um, I also want to mention briefly, before I finish, a couple of other points. And this is a, the first point I want to make, is about time. <clears throat> time is <coughs> both the friend and the enemy of thought. <laughs> As I said before, tr 
true learning, true wisdom, true intelligence takes time to cultivate and develop. Um, it doesn't come easy. It's not a fast food operation. It also depends on memory. And that's why the muse's mother was, was memory, memosyne. Divine intelligence must know an awful lot, must have a very big memory. You know, just a question, where is it all stored? <laughs> In what sort of cosmic memory banks does divine intelligence draw? There's this lovely co concept of the Akashic records, which you get in Hindu and Buddhist teachings and theosophical teachings. What are they? Where are they stored? You know, I'd love to know. Um, <clears throat> how can you access them? I mean, it's said you access them after death, but I think that's cheating. I think we poor humans, as a Promethean, I think we deserve a bit more knowledge, a bit more light in our cave. We should be able to access them even in this world. And I don't mean just on Wikipedia and computer systems. I mean actually in our hearts and minds, you know, which is free. So <clears throat> what is memory? It's some kind of patterning system. Time seems to bring with it symmetries. One of the interesting things Jung pointed to was the question of synchronicity. The divine intelligence often signals its operative through synchronicity. Um, let me share a synchronicity that's interesting. Okay, Aldous Huxley uh, came to visit Timothy Leary <coughs> on the same day that Kennedy was elected as president, right, back in the 60s. President Kennedy was elected. Aldous Huxley, the great founder of perennial philosophy, came to see Timothy Leary, the great genius of... of Consciousness research. And Huxley died on the same day that Kennedy was shot. Right? Now, you know, that to me is a synchronicity at, at work. There's something going on about consciousness and, 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 and journeyings into the spirit. And, and that's just one little example of, of how life synchronicity seems to throw up patterns. Jung had this idea of holistic intelligence, that there's a fourfold intelligence, the sensual, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual. And you could argue different deities are giving service to different aspects, they're like different archetypes. I think that's a, that's a very interesting mapping process that's going on. That work is not finished. You know, transpersonal psychology, the work of Ken Wilber, the notion of the spectrum of consciousness, the, the notion of what he calls integral theory. Um, these are attempts to map the way that these multiple intelligences operate, both in human beings and in the wider cosmos. <clears throat>